Eastman Chemical Company. Do we have an appellate? Have they appeared uh, so far this morning? We have not seen them, Your Honor. Okay. Let me check. Have we received any word, Madam Clerk? No, Your Honors. We've not received word and no one has seen them this morning show up. Uh, I think probably the only thing we can do is we can hear your argument if you want to make a presentation or this case could be submitted on the briefs. Uh, Your Honor, I'd be glad to uh, both give an argument and answer any questions the court might have. And you may do so. And as far as the appellant's position, they, uh, their case is submitted on briefs. Okay, you may proceed, sir. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, my name is Joe Harvey uh, of the Kingsport Bar, and I'm here on behalf of the appellant, uh, excuse me, the appellee and defendant, Eastman Chemical Company. This morning, we're asking that the trial court's decision be affirmed in its entirety. At the outset, I'd like to address the argument that the reference to health effects in the definition of asbestos action limits the application of the Tennessee Asbestos Claims Priorities Act to claims for bodily injury. The definition of asbestos action does not stop with the reference to health effects. It goes further than that. The definition specifically includes claims that are based on a fear or risk of disease or other injury. In other words, a claim that's based on the fear or risk of injury or disease from asbestos exposure is a claim arising out of the health effects of exposure to asbestos. And that definition describes plaintiff's claims in this case exactly. Plaintiff's claims are unique uh, because they rely entirely on reputational damages for diminished property value. There's no alleged physical injury to property. It's purely reputational damages. In other words, the plaintiff's claims for reputational injury to property are based entirely on the theory that a potential purchaser of her property will pay less due to the fear of the disease resulting from exposure to the asbestos. In that regard, both the existence and the measure of plaintiff's damages are, are caused by, and, and the amount of damages results from, asbestos. Plaintiff's claims for reputational damage is necessarily caused by the substance allegedly causing the reputational harm, and that substance here is asbestos. Plaintiff's claim in this case can't be separated from the substance causing the damage any more than a defamation claim can be separated from the content of the defamatory statement. Was this another chemical uh, that was possibly related to uh, this matter involved? There were, no other, uh, there were no other substances identified in the amended complaint that allegedly entered plaintiff's property. So generally, I think the, th the substances fall into three categories. You've got asbestos, which plaintiff specifically alleges entered her property. You've got unidentified, uh, unknown contaminants that are generally alleged. And then you have a third category of substances that plaintiff says were involved, but never alleges that they entered her property. Um, and in this case, Your Honor, 
the point, uh, the, the issue related to the other contaminants is uh, that the, the, the existence of those other contaminants does not change the fact that plaintiff's claims in this case do rely on asbestos. And she had mentioned that uh, and admitted that in several, several places. Uh, she admitted that in her response to our motion to dismiss in her briefing that asbestos is a causal factor. But if asbestos is a causal factor, the existence of other substances does not remove the application of the act. Those what about, let's see, uh, she alleged uh, personal injury or the fear of personal injury. Uh, what about the property damage itself by itself, that the, the value of the property may eventually go down because of this contamination? That is her allegation. There is no allegation of actual physical damage to the property. The, the damages are limited to reputational harm. And of course, that reputational harm is necessarily tied to the substance that causes that harm. And in this case, that substance is asbestos. Uh, that's the only substance that she identifies or alleges in her amended complaint uh, that entered her property. And I think it's important to note that, that we are here addressing an amended complaint. Plaintiff had the opportunity to replead her allegations um, and, and remove reliance to asbestos if she could have. And when asked by the trial court why her amended complaint retained references to asbestos, the plaintiff explained that, that those references were necessary to explain why and how, quote, the reputation of the community has been damaged and that it would be experienced by a third party prospective buyer of these properties. That's in the record, uh, volume three, page 29, the hearing uh, before, the, before the trial court. So the plaintiff specifically explains that um, her claims for reputational damage are based on asbestos, and she could not replete her claims without relying on asbestos. Likewise, the, although the, the existence of those damages are based on asbestos, the measure of damages is also based on asbestos. For example, would plaintiff claim that the reputation of her property was damaged in the same amount if the substance that entered her property had been topsoil or even plastic debris or some other substance? Obviously not. Stated differently, would the amount of plaintiff's damages be different if another substance were involved? Obviously it would. Uh, there is I've got to, I'm going to interrupt you. Here, here is my question. I, I understand that the plain language of the act does not limit itself to bodily injury. Um, it, it talks specifically about fear of injury. But how, how do you, I guess I'm having a problem reconciling the fear of injury language with the requirement that in order to proceed, you have to show proof of some sort of physical injury. So how do you sustain a fear of injury claim? Uh, well, Your Honor, I think the, the answer to that is, goes back to the, the legislative intent for for the act itself, which is to preserve resources for those individuals who have the most serious illness. And so the requirement for demonstrating an actual physical impairment is, as a legislature, we've made the decision, the policy decision, that we only want individuals who are sick to be able to bring asbestos claims. And so it is, it is, a, it is broad, um, but it's not unlimited. There are situations where an individual could bring a property damage claim. And you list some of those in your brief, if I remember correctly. Yes, Your yeah. Honor. And in that regard, the, the plaintiff's claims here are unique, uh, very unique, because they rely on reputational damage as opposed to actual physical mm -hmm. injury. So it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a, a unique claim. And the court's ruling would be very narrow. It would be that these types of claims where both the existence and the measure of damages rely on the presence of asbestos, those types of claims fall under the act. In contrast, claims that do not rely on asbestos for either the existence or the measure of damages would not be covered. 
Is it your argument that any claim that has to do with asbestos is going to fall under the act unless there are, and there's a couple of exceptions, veterans and something else, workers' comp. Um, but, but those are the only two exclusions for anything that relates to asbestos because we're tracking the language of the statute as we must. Yes, Your Honor, I think, that, I think that's correct. There are two exceptions, workers' comp and claims for veterans' benefits, which I think demonstrates the, the breadth of the statute, uh, that those two were specifically carved out. But um, there, are, there are property damage claims where um, asbestos is involved, it may be involved, but it's not, it, the claims themselves don't arise out of, they aren't based on asbestos. Asbestos just happens to be involved. Um, an example might be a landowner who owns some timber and asbestos debris or asbestos containing material blows onto the property, and as a result, that timber can no longer be used for flooring or furniture and has to be sold for pulp wood. In that scenario, uh, the fact that it was asbestos could have been anything. Any substance would have caused that damage. So the fact that it was asbestos is not critical to the claim. And likewise, the damages are measured by some. The damages are measured by the change in in the sale value of that product. Uh, and this case is very different from that because she is relying on reputational damage and the generalized public fear uh, that goes along with asbestos. I mean, asbestos is unique in that regard. Uh, there is a fear, a public fear of asbestos that doesn't exist with other substance. And that's exactly what the plaintiff is relying on in this case to make out her claims. And with respect to the exceptions, there are two, and only two. And plaintiff's argument essentially asks that this court judicially create another exception for reputational damage to property. Um, not only is that exception not in the statute, it would also open up um, a, 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 an ability to circumvent the statute, because any claim could then be couched in terms of reputational damage to property and, and the benefits, the, the policy underlying the statute would be circumvented because plaintiffs could uh, couch their, uh, their claims in terms of rep rep uh, reputational damage to, to personal property. Um, I'd also like to address the fact that uh, plaintiff's reply brief says that, that plaintiff's complaint does not reference uh, prospective buyers. Um, frankly, Your Honors, that argument's disingenuous uh, for two reasons. Um, one, defendants didn't coin the term prospective buyers. Uh, that was a phrase that was first used by the plaintiff's counsel um, in their response to defendants' motion to dismiss. Uh, and that's um, uh, in, the, in plaintiff's response to the motion to dismiss, which is found in the record, uh, volume one, page 156. Uh, the plaintiff specifically wrote um, and explained that the cause of the diminution in value is derived more generally from the reputational damage to the community caused by the steam pipe incident as a whole and as perceived by prospective buyers. That's where that phrase comes from. It also comes from the hearing before the trial court, and that's at uh, record volume 3, page 29. Uh, the plaintiff explained why and how um, the reputation of the community has been damaged, uh, and that would be experienced by uh, third-party prospective buyers of those properties. Again, using that language, that's where that language came from. Finally, Your Honor, I'd like to address uh, what the effect of adopting plaintiff's position in this case would essentially upend the priorities that were established um, in the Act. Um, in 2016, when the Tennessee legislature passed the law, they acknowledged what the Supreme Court had described as an asbestos litigation crisis. Uh, the legislature explained in passing the law that the public interest requires giving priority to exposed individuals who are sick. The plaintiff is not. Therefore, the legislature said that with the Asbestos Claims Priorities Act, it's the intent of the General Assembly to give priority to asbestos claimants who can demonstrate actual physical impairment 
caused by exposure to asbestos. And the plaintiff's claims in this case are emblematic of the asbestos litigation crisis and are precisely the type of claims uh, that the legislature intended to cover with the act. That is, claims by a plaintiff who has no actual physical impairment but rely on the fear associated with asbestos and the public's generalized fear of asbestos. Allowing plaintiff's claims to go forward while preventing a claim from an individual with a, with a, who's been exposed to asbestos and has a minor injury but can't meet the requirements of the act would, would have the anomalous result of prioritizing reputational property damages over personal injury claims, and that would not be appropriate. If a plaintiff cannot bring a claim for fear of exposure to asbestos, it should not be allowed to bring a property damage claim that is based on the fear of exposure to asbestos. Accordingly, we believe the trial court correctly um, ruled that the Asbestos Claims Act for, uh, applies to plaintiff's claims and properly dismissed them in this case. Unless there are any questions, I'll conclude my remarks. I hear none. Thank you very much for your presentation. Thank this you. case is now submitted to the court and uh, all the parties should receive our opinion and judgment within a reasonable period of time. You may be excused. Madam Clerk, will you recess the court until 1.30?